Today's webinar is all on personalized nutrition. Um, it's very much a hot topic at the moment. There's um, lots of research coming out in this area. Um, we've previously, you know, had a webinar on this, um, but we're going to be seeing kind of the other side of the coin this time with Dr. Nicola Guess um, very much critically analyzing the current evidence base um, and really seeing where we're at with, with all this kind of research at the moment. And I just really want to take this opportunity to just say a huge thank you to the team who have absolutely done most of the work in the background to get this webinar up and running today. So thank you so much to you all. And I'd finally just like to say a massive thank you to our sponsors of ENLP who are here on the on the um, slide who continue to support the programme. So thank you very much. So without further ado, and as promised, back to that slide, um, I'd like to move on to introduce our speaker today um, and welcome Dr. Nicola Guess. Nicola is a clinical and academic dietitian with research and clinical uh, interests focusing on type 2 diabetes and cardiometabolic disease. Today, she is going to present a review of the experimental, observational and clinical trial evidence behind personalised nutrition and reflect on where this evidence leads us in terms of translating science into current practice. She's also going to touch on her current uh, research where she's leading a large type 2 diabetes remission programme which is at the University of Oxford. And she's also going to share some details about her own leadership uh, journey to date. Um, so just to say any questions throughout, please drop them in the Q&A box. Um, Amanda's going to come on after uh, Nicholas finished speaking to, to moderate the Q&A. Um, and please um, share any of the your thoughts or discussions on Twitter. You've got the uh, handles of um, and the hashtag there on the screen. And just to highlight that um, Nicholas' uh, Twitter Twitter handle does have two underscores that isn't a typo and um, so that's enough from me over to you Nicola and thank you so much thank you Emily um, I think yes if you shop stop sharing I can share mine so Emily thank you for the really nice introduction I won't spend too much time talking about me um, except to say for any of you who who see patients or do clinical research for me combining the two has been really transformative in the sense that seeing patients helps me understand gaps in our in, in the literature, gives me ideas for studies. Um, and likewise, doing research enables me to really help patients a lot. And I've specialized quite uniquely, I think, in just one area. You don't see that a lot, I think, now. Uh, my expertise lies pretty much just in type 2 diabetes prevention and management um, and, gen and general cardiometabolic disease. There are two areas that I'm interested in. One is pathophysiology. So that's looking at what goes on underneath type 2 diabetes and how can nutrition address that. But the second thing is, well, how does all of the research we do actually affect patients? That's the goal at the end of the day. Um, and that's a theme you'll hear throughout my talk on personalized nutrition. So I work a lot on applied pragmatic trials, um, pretty much embedded in the NHS. And as Emily said, the big study that I'm leading day to day is New Dawn. And the idea of this is that we are giving patients a choice of weight loss programs, or it's a guided choice of weight loss programs, which we hope will encourage more people to take up the offer of type 2 diabetes remission. So we're doing the feasibility study development now. Uh, and I can't tell you anything about that um, because we're not going to finish till about four years. But that's a background about me. And I really want to emphasize, yes, science is cool, but ultimately, if it doesn't affect and improve patients' lives, what's the point? So um, with that said, let me get on to my presentation. Uh, so personalized nutrition, what's the evidence? Um, and I, I talk a lot about this. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know I'm pretty much a skeptic. Um, I like to think I have an open mind and I'll hopefully be as positive as I can today, tell you where the research is at and give a really uh, a critical review of what I think the evidence is telling us right now. So firstly, personalized nutrition, we could even call it pre precision nutrition. It means a lot of things. You can personalize a diet based on a person's tastes or preferences. This is basically what we do in clinical dietetics. You listen to what someone's eating and you adapt the diet for them. You can personalize based on a phenotype. And by that, I mean observable traits. So if someone has for example, elevated cholesterol, if they have elevated glucose, that's an observable trait, a phenotype. And I think we could argue you can personalize a diet for that. But the big thing, the really sexy thing 
that's getting all the attention is this kind of personalized based on inherent biological differences. So that's primarily what I'm going to focus on today. But first of all, I want to think about why are we doing all of this research? So what's the point of personalized nutrition? Well, of course, firstly, you if you can personalize the diet to someone, you get better adherence. They stick to the dietary recommendations you make. So you get better clinical outcomes because people are adhering and sticking to the dietary advice better. But the other really important thing, potentially, is that you get better outcomes per se. So it's not just due to people adhering to the diet, it's that it's biologically more appropriate and more efficacious at fixing whatever biological problem or, or um, symptom, for example, that the person has. So I am going to really quickly cover the first two because I don't think they're controversial, um, but I just want to give you my thoughts on each of these. So can we, what's the evidence behind personalizing a diet based on tastes and preferences? There was a big food for me trial, which did a terrific job at getting at this. It was a super large trial all across Europe and over a thousand people were recruited and randomized. They were randomized to conventional dietary advice, you know, have more fruit and veg, less saturated fat, that kind of advice. They then had three other personalized nutrition groups. The first one was personalized based on their baseline diet. So people filled in um, a dietary intake record and based on that, an algorithm responded and said, oh, how about having a bit more of this or a bit less of this? The next personalized nutrition group was the adaptation based on the baseline diet, in addition to giving dietary advice to, for observable traits like high cholesterol, for example. The other personalized um, group, the final one, was both of those two things, personalized based on baseline diet, personalized based on phenotype, but they also added some genetics in there as well. The primary outcome of this study was dietary changes. And this is important. They weren't the primary outcome. The, the most important thing they were looking at was not the effect on cholesterol or weight. It's is this better at people sticking to dietary changes? And what they showed very clearly, if you personalize the diet based on what someone's currently eating, you get better improvements in, in behavior. So people were having less red meat, less salt, less saturated fat and more folate. It did not make a difference in terms of behavior, whether you um, personalize based on the phenotype or the genotype. So not controversial, I don't think. Do we get better adherence to dietary advice if we personalize the diet based on what people are currently eating? Yes. The second one, what's the, the evidence for personalizing based on phenotype? So like I said, this is an observable trait. So you could tailor it, tailor the diet to cholesterol, glucose, blood pressure. Um, is, is, is tailoring it to any of those things better than generic advice? Have more fruit and veg, less saturated fat, etc. And I, I've covered this really briefly, but I don't think this is controversial either. We have the DASH study, huge studies done um, during the 90s, very strong evidence that if you, a, a diet that was really biologically targeted for blood pressure, which was uh, dairy, lots of whole grains, fruit and veg, it's high in potassium, that uh, lowered blood pressure compared to a healthy diet, which even had 10 servings of fruit and veg a day. We also have evidence, I haven't put the reference here, but it's, it's on one of my slides, so I'll highlight it. And that's that a high protein, low carbohydrate diet is better than a healthy Mediterranean diet for glucose control. And that's because the amino acids in protein stimulate the pancreas to produce insulin. In combination with low carb, it lowers glucose. So can you personalize a diet based on observable traits? I think there's pretty good evidence you can. So cover those two really quickly. What I'm gonna focus on about it for the rest of my talk is about the inherent biological differences. Can you personalize based on those? And this is one of those things in my cynical opinion that's captured people's attention because like I said, it sounds super sexy and scientific because you are personalizing based on omics, the genome, the microbiome, the metabolome. It all sounds very, very cutting edge. And so the idea, and it's a fair idea, I'm being unfair, it is a fair idea that if, if you take someone's own genetics and what their metabolism looks like, it's telling you, can you personalize diets based on that to get better outcome? So that's what this is all about. 
And there are buzzwords here because this is zillions and zillions of data point. You've got big data. You can use artificial intelligence. It's all about machine learning to really optimize nutrition. And it's big news. So these are the academic um, consortia or institutions that have published on this or currently have a lot of funding into this. But there's the, the Wiseman Institute of Science. That's an institute in Israel that did some of the first work in this area. I'll talk about that. There's the PREDICT studies. This is done between um, Harvard, King's and a couple of others. There's Preventomics. That's a European consortia. So is Stance for Health. That's new. CODIA is a new European consortia that's just been funded, as is NutriShield. And the NIH, that's the National Institute of Health in the, in the United States, announced $170 million worth of funding into personalized nutrition recently. Furthermore, there are 12 companies, <clears throat> I think at least two of which are aligned with academic institutions that are already offering this kind of personalized nutrition. In, in this case, this study was based on the microbiome um, already. So yes, there's research being done, but boom, this is already in the commercial space. So there's two key things that, that I think that matter here. In terms of this omics-driven personalized nutrition, two things count. If people are truly different, if people have a unique biology, does an analysis of that person's unique biology lead to personalized, unique recommendations in terms of their diet? That's question one. The second question is, if you can prescribe these diets, these personalized diets based on someone's unique biology, do you actually get better outcomes compared to a healthy diet of fruit and veg, low saturated fat, et cetera? So we'll take a look at both of those questions because I think that's what this ultimately is about. So let's look at the first one. Does an analysis of an individual's own lead to personalized kind of unique recommendations? Why have I highlighted unique? because this is the selling point of, of many of these companies. So I've just taken, I am not telling you which companies they are, but I've taken um, some advertising kind of slogans and statements that these companies are making. And it's on the basis of academic research and it's that your body is unique and so is the food you need. <clears throat> so for me, if, you're, if you think someone's body is unique, if you've got evidence there is, I would expect very unique, very distinct diets being prescribed. So let's take a look at that. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the first um, study that has presented data on this. So I mentioned the, the Wiseman Institute in Israel. They published a, a study in 2015 in, in Cell that made a lot of noise. And they had a really nice study design. It was really ambitious. And I really um, congratulate the investigators for what they were attempting to do. So they looked at a bunch of different factors in 800 people. They measured the microbiome. They did blood tests. Um, including uh, continuous glucose monitoring. They did questionnaires of, of current intake, anthropometrics, and a food diary. And then they put this into a, an algorithm. They did a lot of machine learning on it. And what they have, they say, is a, an algorithm that can design a diet based on all of that info. So when you put all of that evidence together, so you put all of the inputs, the CGM, the anthropometrics, everything they're eating, the microbiome, what does their algorithm recommend? Well, this is one of their studies. This is the study, by the way, that I mentioned was comparing high protein to Mediterranean diet. Now, the investigators in cell, excuse me, <clears throat> don't advertise this fact, but this is their algorithm. And it's tucked away, I'm sorry to say, in the supplementary data. And the PPT, that's the personalized diet, is on the left-hand side. Now, look at what they're recommending to people. That is 21% of energy from carbohydrates and 51% of energy from fat. So their algorithm, which is microbiome, everything else, is telling pretty much everyone, because that standard deviation there looks pretty small, is telling everyone, cut carbs and have more fat. It's a low-carb, high-fat diet. I don't see any evidence here that all of these inputs are recommending distinct diets. For example, that someone has more or less firmicutes and therefore they can or cannot metabolize carbs better. There's no evidence here of variation or distinct um, dietary recommendations. Um, and in fact, if you were to design a diet based on the acute response um, to, to foods in the glucose response, you would get 
low carb recommendations, you would get high protein recommendations. So this to me isn't a surprise. And my interpretation of what they've done here is one of their big inputs into the um, algorithm was the CGM data. So they recorded what happened to people's glucose after they ate certain foods. That CGM data told them that you're going to get a lower glucose if you have fewer carbohydrate containing foods and more protein and fat containing foods. That to me is not a surprise. Was this a one off? No, it wasn't because again, this is this is their algorithm in the original paper. And in this instinct, sorry, in this instance, they had 21% of carbohydrate from carbohydrates. Again, the algorithm is just telling you to cut carbs, it's telling everyone to cut carbs. Um, and it's recommending a high protein diet as well. Uh, and I'm going to come to why a high protein, low carb diet lowers glucose anyway. We've known that for a long time. So does an analysis of an individual's own lead to personalized dietary recommendations? I don't see any evidence of that here. Now, I don't think the predict group have presented any evidence of what their, their algorithm is, is prescribing, so I can't comment on that, but I can describe some of the data from Preventomics. That is the European consortia. They have a slightly different approach to personalized nutrition. It's similar in the sense that they are measuring the metabolome. Um, they're looking at some personalized choices in terms of tastes and preferences, but they don't use the microbiome, I should add that. And they took um, basically healthy individuals, more or less, randomized them in a one-to-one -one ratio based on their cluster, which was people with oxidative stress, people with inflammation, people with uh, different carbohydrate metabolism, lipid metabolism, and microbiota generated metabolites. So they basically used a bunch of metabolomic data to cluster people into these kind of um, categories, and they randomized them based on that categories. And the work they did, they say it's proprietary, so they can't give as much information, but they use some SNPs, which I presume we're looking at differences in carbohydrate metabolism and so forth. And they use 51 metabolomic biomarkers in the urine, plasma and serum. And that's pretty much all the info they gave us. But nevertheless, it's an omics approach. They're using, as I said, kind of metabolomic data to personalize diets to people. So if you use all of that information, does their algorithm recommend distinct diets to people, personalized diets. Again, there's not evidence of that that I can see. The personalized nutrition group didn't recommend any, or the algorithm didn't recommend anything different um, or didn't result in dietary changes um, compared to the control group, except for dietary fiber. It, the, the algorithm recommended a lot more dietary fiber to people. So this isn't an, necessarily an ideal way of looking at this because some of these um, Consortia might argue, well, it's not just about the nutrient. It's not about carb. It's about how some people respond to potato versus pasta. Um, but there's no evidence of that in the literature. And like I said, particularly with the algorithm that's used CGM as an input, to me, all that they've done is, is recommended diets based on the information that that CGM would give uh, in type 2 diabetes, which is a low carb diet. So to conclude, what is the evidence behind omics-based personalized nutrition in terms of the question, does an analysis of an individual's own lead to personalized unique dietary recommendations? And again, not as far as the evidence to date suggests. So let's move on to that next really important question. Does this analysis of a person's um, own lead to better clinical outcomes? So this is kind of a difficult one to answer in terms of this study, because remember, this study to me, it wasn't personalized nutrition. They just followed the CGM data, which would have told anyone cut carbs um, and replace it with fat or protein. And so the, the data from the personalized nutrition uh, paper is on the left-hand side. That is the postprandial glucose excursions. So the red is a healthy Mediterranean diet and the blue is the high protein, low carb diet. So they've called it personalized nutrition. I'm calling it a high protein, low carb diet. And as you can see, you get much better glycemic control. So that's on the left-hand side. That's from the quote unquote personalized nutrition. 
better glycemic outcomes, but look on the right hand side. This is a study that compared a, a similar macronutrient composition, about 25 to 30 to 30 percent of calories from protein, 20 percent of calories from carbs, so a high protein, low carb diet. And look, you get the same reduction in glucose in people with type 2 diabetes. So, yes, this app produced better clinical outcomes in people with type 2 diabetes, but I don't think that's because it was personalized. I think it was a very phenotypic approach to nutrition, which I think there's good evidence for. Let's have a look at the, the next study. And this is the only other study to date that I'm aware of that has presented data. This is the Preventomics one. So remember, they didn't look at the microbiome, but they looked at SNPs. They looked at metabolomic markers in the urine serum um, and um, saliva. And their primary outcome was weight loss and fat loss. So they didn't see any difference. They got two kilograms of fat loss in the personalized nutrition group and two kilograms of fat loss in the control, no change in body weight either. And I think their conclusion is pretty striking. And they said personalized dietary plans don't result in greater health benefits over a generic but healthy diet in a 10 week clinical trial. And I've got to say congratulations to this consortium because they had a really good hypothesis. They registered their trial properly. They carried out the trial properly. They had a really fair control group. And I'll come to that towards the end. The control group was solid. The trial was solid. And they presented their data and said, gee, didn't make a difference. And that's exactly how we should do science. Now, does this mean that because it didn't affect weight loss or fat loss, that, and that was their primary outcome, that it might not help with anything? No, because maybe this kind of personalized nutrition does. Um, but all we can do is go on the evidence we have, and that's the evidence there is. So that's it. And if you're thinking, well, hold on a second, there's so much hype, there's millions and millions of dollars being put into this, that is the evidence we have that number one, you can even prescribe diets that are distinct, that are personalized based on omics. I don't think there's evidence for that. And number two, there's no evidence in the literature that I can see that I'm aware of that it's better than generic healthy advice. Um, so why is there all this noise about it? What other data do we have on this omics driven personalized nutrition? We have lots of data points. I imagine that the Excel spreadsheets, whatever um, are, are being used, are hundreds of thousands of columns long. Every SNP, every gut microbiome, um, every permutation of relationships between different bacteria in the microbiome, there's a ton of data points. And the thing about having lots and lots of data points is you can make endless correlations. And if you can make endless coronation, some of them are going to flag up as being positive and being significant. And if any of you have ever taken a large data set um, in the UK, for example, we have the UK Biobank or the National Diabetes, uh, sorry, the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. I encourage you to download that database, just run some correlations and you will find magnesium is significantly correlated to HDL cholesterol or triglycerides are significantly correlated to vitamin B12. Because when you get large data sets, you are going to find a ton of positive correlations. It doesn't mean it means anything. But because there is so much data, none of it is causal. There is very little trial data. There are lots of publications. But I hope I've convinced you the evidence out there is nothing that we should be getting exciting about yet, in my opinion. So let me just talk a little bit further about the issue with, with the way we approach research. And it, it's type 1 error. And type 1 error is basically a false positive. And that means, like I just said when I was talking through the last slide, if you have huge data sets and you are just looking for things that might be related to each other, so you might be looking at the proportion of promiquities, is it related to the peak in glucose at 60 minutes, for example, if you keep searching that way, you will always find hits. You'll always find things that you think, oh, this could be related. Maybe people with too much vermicutes have elevated glucose. It might just be a spurious correlation. And you've got to do the work to find out, is this real? Does it matter? And like I said, if you go through any large data set in large numbers, you will all large population number sample sizes, you will always find statistical significance easily. So a P of less than 0, 0, 0, 001. 
what we care about, and this is what I talked about at the start, is it clinically significant? Are, are we, if we introduce this into a clinic, into a public health service, going to get meaningful improvements in triglycerides, cholesterol weight? That's the question. And my biggest concern with a background in type 2 diabetes like I have is looking at glucose as a primary outcome, particularly in these kind of large cross-sectional analyses is that there is huge natural intraperson variation in glucose. So for example, in my PhD and my postdoc work, I probably did 600 oral glucose tolerance tests. So I looked around the literature a lot and occasionally I would have to bring people back to give them two oral glucose tolerance tests. And very often we might see someone who was borderline pre-diabetic or looked like they were pre-diabetic on one glucose tolerance test would bring them back two weeks later and they were normal, they were healthy. So postprandial glucose has huge natural variation. It doesn't necessarily mean that whatever intervention that you're looking at is influencing that glucose. It might just be the normal ups and downs. And a big question in the literature, and if you're interested in this, um, Tom Wolliver um, from Canada has published really intelligent uh, data on this. He's written great commentaries that he thinks, and I, I tend to agree, that when investigators in these big personalized nutrition studies are looking at what they think is interpersonal, so between people differences in glucose variation, what they're actually seeing is the natural glucose response and changes you get within a person. And Tom Oliver did a study, I've put it there if you want to take a look at it, that suggests if you really want to accurately control for intra person variation, you need to give the same meal to the same person three times. And to my knowledge in, in these studies, at the, as a maximum, they've given the same meal twice. And I don't probably think that's robust enough. So in terms of moving forward, what do we need? I think we need, and I would encourage um, the consortia involved in these this work to demonstrate what their algorithms are recommending, show that they're recommending high fiber diets for some people, maybe other people need to avoid higher protein foods, for example, show that there is something distinct, there are distinct recommendations these, these algorithms are making. And the second point is trial data, this is what it comes down to, randomize, blind if you can, and have a, a, a pre-specified outcome of what you're looking at, and a good control. So just coming towards the end, let me talk about study designs and, and being careful about how we interpret this research. Because of course, for lots of these algorithms, they might just be recommending more fiber. Great, Why, who wouldn't want to recommend more fiber? It doesn't necessarily need a person, you know, tons of money and resources being put in to measuring a bunch of saliva and um, um, fecal samples, for example. So if all they're doing is recommending a, a more fiber, great. So the control group has to be a, a healthy diet. So it could be the Mediterranean diet. It could be a diet with loads of fruit and veg. It could be an unprocessed diet, but it's got to be a healthy diet. The second point is that the control group must be matched for contact. So for example, whenever you do an intervention, if you do a weight loss intervention, when you recruit people to it, number one, they are unique people. The people who sign up for clinical studies are more motivated than, motivated than the average person. The second point is in, in lots of clinical trials, you'll see the person weekly or maybe monthly. And that contact, that support for a patient is going to motivate them to make healthy changes and help them to lose weight. So you need a control group because if you're if you want to test whether an algorithm, personalized nutrition algorithm is better than typical dietary advice, you need to control for the healthy diet and for the contact that that personalized dietary algorithm is giving. And let me give you an example. I'm not gonna say which study this is, but this is the a clinical trial registration of a personalized nutrition app. So you can see their control group is generalized nutrition guidelines currently used by USDA. Perfectly fine, because that will be fruit and veg, low saturated fat, whole foods, et cetera. But if you look at the um, description on the left-hand side in the column, it's in the form of a digital leaflet. So what I imagine is that the control group get access to a leaflet that they can read if they want to, maybe once, maybe twice. By contrast, if you look at the intervention group, it's a personalized nutrition app. So they're using all of their 
um, microbiome and all of the other inputs into that app, fine. But the, uh, they are also seeing people more frequently. The individual is going to get more contact, more nudging, more motivation, more support. So the control and intervention in this case have not controlled for the contact and the, the motivational input. So we will not know when this study is published whether the greater effectiveness, and I've got no doubt the intervention group's gonna do better here, we, we will not be able to tell whether the personalized nutrition app got better outcomes because of all of the sexy inputs or because they simply gave the participant more support and more attention. So we need really well-designed clinical trials to look at this. And so this is my, my final point on this. There are types of biological, biologically driven advice that there is good evidence behind. I don't want to ignore that. Any dietitians on the call, you might have seen people with um, congenital um, disorders of amino acid metabolism, for example. Um, so I've missed an E there. Maple syrup, urine disease, um, PKA and homocystinuria. Um, there are also, there's a great study that was published in JAMA looking at a certain genotype that seems to respond differently to supplementation with riboflavin. So there is evidence out there. My critique is with this kind of omics driven um, dietary advice. So can I summarize my thoughts on omics driven personalized nutrition in one slide? And I'm very just sorry to say right now, based on the evidence available, it's this. Um, so with that, I am happy to take any questions. Nicola, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I think that um, final image is going to be engraved in my head for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, I think Amanda's going to pop on. She's um, been busy um, collating sort of the themes of questions that have been coming through for us. So um, welcome, Amanda. Yes. So I tried my best to, to to group the questions into themes. Put the questions a bit off, a little bit out of what you've um, mentioned or you presented today. But I'll try my best to, to see whether we can cover as much um, as as possible. Uh, I just wanted to start through the end of my um, <laughs> my list because it's, it's it's a good link with your final slide. Uh, in terms of evidence gaps. So there's a lot of questions related to recommendations and for suggestions for future studies. So one question says that the DNA test and the CGM, if they don't work, how far do you think we are from the real personalized nutrition for optimal health? I mean, that's that's really difficult to answer in a broad way, but let me let me kind of talk about specifics. And it's DNA can mean millions of millions of things. Genes affect outcomes in different ways. And there's evidence for some, you know, like, like a congenital disorder having a real impact on the way a person metabolizes nutrients. And you can fix that problem very, very evidently when we look at some of those congenital amino acid disorders. So, you know, you could call that personalized nutrition because it's not it's not an observable trait. It's not, you know, a, the kind of phenotypic personalized nutrition. Um, so I think when we're talking about personalized nutrition, we need to use descriptors like I've used. So omics driven. So let me say how far are we away from omics driven personalized nutrition being effective? A long, long time. And, and let me just add a further thought. You know, when we look about dietary related diseases in the world, whether it's malnutrition or overnutrition, this is not because people are not eating the right foods for their microbiome. It's because fast food is everywhere. High fat, high sugar, poorly processed, poor nutrition is available everywhere cheaply. That's the big, that's, that's the problem. That's the issue here. So this kind of microbiome, you know, omics driven approach, maybe if it works, it's going to improve outcomes for an absolutely minuscule pro pro proportion of the population. Can I just butt in there just as a, que as a question off the back of that? So obviously, look, like that's talking wider in terms of our landscape. And from a political standpoint, that's arguably where we need to be focusing our energy. Do you worry that kind of with the amount of funding, I wasn't aware of the amount of funding in the states that this was now getting. Do you think there's a concern that maybe policy might take wind of this and start producing or focusing on this side of things as opposed to more of the systemic wider issues? 
I'm sorry to say, I think that's a great question, but yet I'm not sorry to say that's a great question. That's a great question, but I'm sorry to say, yes, I think you're right. And I think particularly with the governments, I mean, I can only speak to the UK, there's a great wariness of nanny state. No one wants to regulate food. No one wants to tax food. No one wants to put their hands on this market. So some, somebody coming along and saying, hey, it's not because there is any, anything wrong with the landscape we have. It's just because people aren't eating the right foods for their own metabolome and that might be very attractive to many individuals who would much rather not address the elephant in the room which is just the food landscape which is one hell of a problem that we have to change that's quite good yes i think this leads to another set of questions which is related to ethical implications unintended consequences and consumer behaviors i got three questions and then uh, I think that they are all related. So, um, so the first one is how can we make use of CGM correctly without creating the carb spike in glucose phobia among consumers? And, and the second one, it is also related to, to kind of um, unintended consequences. Are any ethical considerations for practitioners claiming to offer personalized nutrition services? And uh, if this can also lead to personalized nutrition, can also uh, lead to inducing overeating. Okay, let me, you might have to remind me there of the second one, but let me That's address right. it. So, <laughs> CGM in people without diabetes, and by diabetes, I would include pre-diabetes. So talking about people without pre-diabetes or type two, it's a long answer, so I won't I won't go into a full explanation, but there's basically no evidence that the degree of glucose excursions that we see in people with, with the standardized cutoffs for normal glucose tolerance are problematic. You know, and the point is it's not that there's evidence it they are harmful or they're not. There's simply no evidence out there because we don't have any data sets of CGM derived glycemic outcomes. Um, or CGI, CGI derived parameters and any outcome. So we've got no clue. But one of my concerns about focusing on say a, a fairly minuscule rise in glucose is that that's where the focus get put on. Whereas about half of people have a cholesterol level, which is, is, is a genuine concern and that we have evidence for in the population. I think at least a third of people have a blood pressure, which is a concern and is something we need to be worried about in the population. And my concern is by focusing on glucose, that we've got no evidence as a problem, people are going to be making dietary changes which could uh, det detract from interventions that could reduce blood pressure and reduce cholesterol. So I think that's my major concern. All right, okay. And then the second one is in terms of any, yeah, so which will you kind of, answer indirectly because the ethical concern for practitioners is that maybe you are focusing more uh, in one thing that might have a detrimental effect and you are not maybe dealing with other issues that, um, that should be priority. Um, yes, and the last one is in terms of um, um, would this, lead, would this uh, personalized nutrition be applied to eating behaviors that could lead to overeating? I mean, I don't know whether overeating or undereating or you know, even avoiding healthful foods. And I mean, I've seen in my practice many patients without diabetes, so without pre-diabetes, who've been using these apps, who have definitely been led to make poorer dietary choices that have worsened their quality of life and worsened their health. Now, of course, I should acknowledge the reason they've come to see me is because they didn't do well with the app. It might well be the case that other people are using these products and it's, it's helping them eat more fruit and veg. And, and that's not a bad thing. My, my concern is, especially as, as scientists and healthcare practitioners, is about the wording we use. And it's about our statements reflecting the evidence that's out there. And I think if you were to answer the question, um, is personalized nutrition necessary to eat a healthy diet? No, absolutely not. There's no evidence for that. All right, so I'm trying to look at some some questions in the chat. So um, if you, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of more holistic personalization based on the adherence of phenotype or biology or lifestyle? Do you have any um, 
and I assumed the person wants to see whether whether um, any of the indicators or maybe information put in the algorithm could be um, could be improved or do you think that would be is there a way to to maybe um, be more um, in terms of holistic in the personalization? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I, I definitely think that this is where big data can be very helpful and it's it's personalizing based on someone's circumstances and choices you know potentially time time of day potentially their goals that kind of thing and also yes addressing sleep and things like that so if a person was so inclined to kind of know how well they'd slept or um you know what their blood pressure might be so kind of combining things that we have evidence for that matters i do think having that data available and an AI to nudge that person to making a good choice is, is potentially really promising. And primarily it's because it can be done more cheaply and more cost effectively than an individual. So if you are paying a dietitian or anyone to sit at the end of, a, of an app and to be that person given personalized advice, yes, it's really effective, but that's expensive and that prevents it from being scalable. There is a very good argument to be made that good machine learning and good AI that responds to genuinely valid inputs and produces a, a recommendation that is going to improve the person's health is a very good thing. Like I said, just to be very clear, my argument is that right now there's no evidence that any of this very expensive omics is adding anything into this. So, can I there, Nicola. So then, you know, the study where you're saying um, maybe it's not designed appropriately, the new clinical trial. If it, but if the approach is at the moment that people are literally just given a leaflet, then why isn't that? The, because clinically, that is sort of what is done. So, oh, Emily, great question. I'm really glad you answered that, answer that. It all depends on what claim you're going to make on the basis of this study. If you're going to, you know, because of having a control group, even if it's kind of like a nothing control. So like this one where you just give a leaflet, that's a good way of controlling almost for the, as well the motivation of the participants. Because like I said, people coming into clinical trials are different. They're going to do well anyway. So probably some people with that leaflet are going to lose weight. So that's a good control. But if you are going to make any statements about superiority, on the basis of this trial, all that this trial will be able to say is that this intervention is better than a leaflet. It's better than what's currently done. On the other hand, if you are going to say, look, you need to spend X amount of pounds on our app because look at our clinical trial. It was shown to help with four kilograms of weight loss with hiding what the comparator group is. That's a problem. OK, makes sense. Thank did, you. I, did I explain yes. that? Yes, yeah. And I agree with you that the types of people that come to clinical trials, I think everyone always says we know more about rats and students than we do anyone else. So, yeah, I agree. Exactly. And, and just to be very clear. So if, if if your hypothesis is that this omics input is helping prescribe diets which are more efficacious and you're going to get better reductions in triglycerides, you need to account for, for contact and a regular healthy diet. Because if you're saying this is needed, it's better than healthy dietary advice, personalization is needed, you need to demonstrate that with a careful control. Yes, good. Um, I, I think you touched upon that. I have another question in the chat. I think you, you have already mentioned a little bit about that. So there's some questions about intra-individual variability, but also about inter-individual variability. And I think there is a question saying that I am most curious about the glucose his response that the same person um, may have to exactly the same meals on different days. What would be the reason for this in terms of intra, in, you know, variation um, and the same uh, individual? Well, so, um... I'll explain verbally, but I encourage you to check out my Substack where I had a whole piece on this and it lists the many things that can affect the glycemic response to a meal, which have nothing to do with what's in that meal. Um, and I think it's called, I ate some raspberries and my glucose went up. So that's the title you should be looking for. But let me explain just two of those things. The first is something called the second meal effect. 
And that is where the meal that you ate last, whether it's the dinner you ate before a breakfast or whether it's the breakfast you ate before a lunch, what you ate at that previous meal can influence significantly the glycemic response to your next meal. So for example, if you have lentils versus a refined carbohydrate in your evening meal, you will get a much diminished glucose response in, to the breakfast. So that's one thing that can control it. Second thing is things like physical activity. So physical activity can have an effect acutely after you do exercise, the day after, even the day after that, and the day after that. So if you had a banana, immediately following a really vigorous bout of activity, you might actually get a really exaggerated response to the banana. The next day after vigorous physical activity, you'll be very insulin sensitive. So you'll get a lower response to that banana. So those are just two examples, but there are tons of things that influence the glycemic response to a meal that have nothing to do with in that meal. And that's why it makes it so difficult to use CGM to try to understand, are these foods that I should be avoiding? All right, um, first to follow on, I have, I have um, uh, two other questions related to dietary patterns. Um, so are the dietary patterns contain prolonged or multiple spikes associated with negative health outcomes? And are any benefits of food sequencing, sequencing to keep glucose stable in healthy people? In terms of, of the extended glycemic response, and here is, is a really tough to answer to finish definitively and with any confidence, because like I said, we don't have data. What we have is big data sets of hemoglobin A1C that can tell us the average you know, glucose over the previous three months, but probably primarily last one month. And then we have fasting glucose and two hour glucose. So we don't have really big data sets looking at 30 minute glucose, 60 minute glucose. In addition, we don't have, even if we do have that data on fasting and two hour glucose, they will have all been from oral glucose tolerance tests and so not food, or a glucose tolerance tests that were done under standardized conditions in the morning. And none of that can tell us what glucose looks like at 4 p.m. after a snack and what, what the 24 hour glycemic excursions in healthy people look like and how that relates to any disease down the line. So the short answer is we simply don't know. Um, my advice when people say, well, what shall I do is, is base it on your A1C. So for people who are, I mean, I know we have the screening program in the UK, people can get an A1C every year. And that's the best evidence we have right now because we have it in so many people. And if your A1C is between 5.1 and 5.5, there is more than likely zero reason to be concerned whatsoever. Oh, yeah. Mandy, you're on mute. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had a little bit of background noise, so I muted myself. So I have a couple of other questions. And I think, just, just, Amanda, sorry, yeah. just one more, I think, because I'm conscious of time, if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. So um, uh, it would be good to, to maybe um, to finish then with... Um, so if you were, in terms of a clinical relevance or practical applications um and I, I know you mentioned about you 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 couldn't find much information about the algorithm that being used or what type of information that was provided to to some of the participants but if you were to decide what to include in a personalized dietary feedback uh what would be the the, the most useful information to be included uh, for for patients, um, what do you think would be um, kind of um, something of any clinical relevance in terms of feedback to give to, to, to patients? That's a question I can't answer because we need evidence to decide that. And I, And to be very clear, I think it is valid for investigators to be looking at this. You know, we've got omics for lots of people. We've got all this new information. And as scientists, just looking at, okay, is it useful? Can we utilize this information to improve dietary advice and to get better outcomes? But we shouldn't be acting upon that until we have good evidence for it. And for me, there's just simply not good evidence for it. And, you know, de deciding what SNPs you may or may not include, well, it depends. Have you got evidence that those SNPs matter? 
So for example, the JAMA study that I mentioned at the end, I think there was some observational evidence that people with this SNP might have different outcomes. So they ran a very good clinical trial to, to look at, well, do they respond differently to, to riboflavin supplementation? And it's that kind of research that should tell us what information should we be personalizing advice based on? Um, and again, to repeat right now, the, the, the omic stuff, I don't think is adding anything to dietary advice and nutritional advice right now at all. All right, so that's all. And uh, so uh, we do still have some questions, maybe um, if there is any way that we can address those uh, afterwards. Um, I, I, I don't know if there is any plan, but I, I try my best to capture as many as possible and you condense them. Yeah. You, did, you did great, Amanda, well done. Um, yeah, there were so many coming in. I think it's uh, a, a wait and see then, uh, Nicola, to see if... Um, later down the line you know um with the clinical if there's clinical evidence maybe you're on the bandwagon of it but until then you're gonna sit tight where you are exactly yes <laughs> um guys last thing from me is um just to obviously say massive thank you to nicola and for all of you for joining just to say we our next webinar keep an eye out it's going to be in october and it's actually going to be by our very own Amanda, who you've already just met. Um, so Dr. Adeboya is going to speak about um, why do equity, diversity and inclusion matter in nutrition and dietetics? So one not to be missed, hopefully in early October. Again, massive thank you to everyone. This is all going to be recorded and put on YouTube. So if you do want to listen back, um, then it will hopefully be up um, on the ENLP YouTube very, very soon. But um, until the next time we see you, thank you so much for joining and hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.